Let us pray. What we are not, make us. What we have not, give us. What we know not, teach us in the most precious name of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life, who is, who was, and who is to come. Amen. So this morning, I want to welcome you to North Carolina. I woke up this morning and thought, where am I? I am not in Pasadena. This is what it's like to live in North Carolina in the summer, for those of you who don't know. Today is my older brother's birthday. And my brother has always been one of my heroes. And everything he did, I admired. He played football in high school and I naturally developed a love for football. So as I prepared for this morning's sermon, I recalled a story he once heard of a football coach who had two quarterbacks. The first team quarterback was athletic. He was a gifted signal caller and a born leader. The second team quarterback was as athletic as the first teams, however, he lacked that mind for strategy and the ability to call signals effectively. The coach made it to the state championship with his team. The game was in progress. The score was tied. The coach's team had the ball, and the clock was ticking down. The coach felt confident that his team was going to win with his first team quarterback. However, immediately following the snap of the ball, an opposing player broke through the line of scrimmage, slammed the first team quarterback on his head, and he was forced to leave the game. Time was running out. It was time for a miracle. The coach went, oh my God, what am I gonna do? My second team quarterback is not as strategic as the first team, but he put him in the game. The young man walked out onto the field, huddled with the team, and then confidently walked to the line of scrimmage. Surveying the opposing team, and much to everyone's surprise, he called an audible. Now, for some of you who have no clue what an audible is, an audible is when the quarterback changes the play at the line. The ball was snapped. The quarterback handed it off to the running back who ran all the way to the end zone with the winning touchdown. It was an amazing play. Moments later, the coach grabbed his second team quarterback by the shoulder pads and said, son, that was great. How did you call that play? The young man said, well, coach, it wasn't easy. I got up to the line and looked across at two of the biggest players I'd ever seen. I looked at their numbers. One of them was wearing a six on his jersey. The other was wearing a seven. So I just added their numbers together, got 14, <laughs> and called number 14. The coach hesitated a moment and said, but son, six and seven add up to 13. The young man, quite unmoved by the coach's correction, said, you know what, coach? If I was as smart as you, we would have lost the game. <laughs> Things do not always add up the way they are supposed to. When it was evening, the disciples came to Jesus and said, this is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. Now, I want you to stop and imagine what those disciples may have been thinking. 
they were probably saying to each other, is he for real? He has to be kidding. How can we feed all these people? We have only enough for ourselves, five loaves and two fish. Things don't always add up the way they are supposed to when a miracle is needed. Many of you may be aware that except for the story of Jesus' resurrection, the story of Jesus and the disciples feeding a multitude of people with only five barley loaves of bread and two fish is the only other story found in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell this story with some variation. My friends, to feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish is indeed miraculous. However, if we examine Matthew's gospel more closely, the Greek term used in Matthew 14.21 specifies males. And Matthew further emphasizes the point by adding, besides women and children. So in actuality, many Bible scholars believe the real number fed that day could have been as many as 15 to 20,000 people. So why is this story so important that it is found in all four Gospels? It is almost always referred to as the miracle of the feeding of the multitude because so many were fed with so little. What lessons are we to learn from this miracle story? You know, while I believe we could spend time dissecting this gospel and come away with several lessons, this morning, I want to share three possibilities. One of my colleagues once wrote, I believe the first lesson is clear. God depends on us to take part in the aid and redemption of our world. God depends on us to take part in the aid and redemption of our world. Our individual talents are taken and blessed by God and returned to our hands to share with others. If we fail to do so, both our gifts and God's blessings go wanting. With what we have, no matter how little, we can do what we can. Jesus took what the disciples considered a meager offering when compared to the crowd and made it a feast. Jesus shattered the pint-sized expectation of his followers by showing them that little is much when God is in the picture. When we are willing to offer ourselves and our resources, relinquishing our hold on whatever gifts God has given us, I believe God will use ordinary things to create the extraordinary. We must never believe our resources are too little to serve one another and God. The second lesson is that of having compassion. However, it's not passive compassion, that of feeling sorry and not doing anything, is having compassion that leads to action. Some scholars believe that Jesus' compassion for the crowd led to their feeling compassion for each other. So that once the crowd saw Jesus bless the loaves and fish in an effort to share, they too began to share what they had. They took action and created a miracle. The miracle was in their sharing. The miracle was in their offering resources to each other and God. Just as the multitude shared back then and created a miracle, it's time for us to make a miracle. Henry Nouwen wrote, one of our greatest temptations is to relate to each other as interesting characters. And as long as others remain as interesting characters, they remain separate. Our great task is to prevent our fears from placing others into categories and to see them 
as persons. When we see each other as persons, we can begin to share a love greater than we ourselves can grasp, a truth deeper than we ourselves can articulate, a beauty richer than we ourselves can contain. In Matthew 5, 48, it says, to let the love you extend be full, just as God's love is full. I believe, therefore, as children of God, we are called to be transparent to each other, pointing far beyond our character to God, who has given us love, truth, and beauty. The final lesson from today's gospel is that of letting go and doing what you can. I believe if we let go of our feelings of distrust and our inability to share, modern day miracles can happen. If we let go of our fear, we can change the world because it is fear that creates conflict. I have been saddened by the news stories relating to the treatment of mothers and children attempting to cross the borders in California. I contend that they were being turned away because of fear. Like the disciples said, it's a deserted place and the hour is late. Send the crowds away. Send them away so that they can fend for themselves. We don't have enough. I believe it is fear that drives the deadly and heartbreaking strife in Palestine and Israel and Russia and Ukraine. Yes, our news is so fear-driven that it leads us often to be fearful. I want to invite you not to let fear motivate you. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said it, an individual has not started living until he can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. My friends, we are connected through our common humanity. We are one under God and should have no fear, no prejudice, no racism, no bias. King continued, the ultimate measure of a human being is not where one stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where one stands at times of challenge and controversy. The true neighbor will risk position, prestige, and even life for the welfare of others. Now you may be thinking like the disciples, really, Zelda? What can I do with so little? I don't have enough for myself. I'm struggling to make ends meet. I have many challenges. So many, I'm overwhelmed. I don't even know where to begin. So perhaps the story of the little sparrow may help. The rooster came along and found the little sparrow lying on his back with feet up in the air and asked, what are you doing? The sparrow replied, Chicken Little said, the sky was falling and I'm trying to hold it up. <laughs> what? exclaimed the rooster. Do you think a little twerp like you can hold back the sky? The sparrow looked at the rooster and replied, one does what one can. Yes, that is the final lesson. One does what one can. Therefore, if we remember that God depends on us to take action in the aid and redemption of our world while having and showing compassion, true compassion, and doing what we can. If we do these things, we can create miracles, modern day miracles. So let us make seven and six add up to thousands. 
Amen.